Hello and welcome to Facts, Facts webinar called Bison Basics. Our guest presenters today are with the Tonka Funds. I am Larissa McKenna, Facts Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the session. Thank you all for joining us. But before we dive right in, let me take a minute or two for a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust are fact. We are a national nonprofit organization that's headquartered in Illinois. We work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, such as yourselves who are on this, on this webinar, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and by helping consumers make informed food choices. My old wonderful FACT colleague, Samantha, and I run FACT's Humane Farming Program, which works with livestock and poultry farmers from all across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, training courses, mentorship, and of course, webinars on a variety of very fascinating topics. Quick plug that we are currently accepting applications for farmers who are interested in participating as either mentors or mentees in our 2023 mentorship program. Application deadline is uh, later this month, November 30th. So please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn more about all of our farmer services. This time, I am very pleased, honored to introduce our guest presenters, Trudy Ekafi, Arnell Abled, and Jennifer Melitier from the Tonka Fund. Tonka Fund is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation located on the Pine Ridge Reservation in Kyle, South Dakota. Their goal is to convert 1 million acres of virgin prairie to regenerative agriculture built around a buffalo-based economy. Through their work, they're restoring health and prosperity to native communities. So we are super lucky to have these three um, ladies with us today, and I'm really looking forward to their presentation. So I think without further ado, uh, Arnell, I believe that you are first up, so I will uh, turn the floor over to you. Good afternoon. This is Arnell Abel. Nice to meet you. Hold on a second here. Let me get to where I need to be. Oh my goodness. Sorry. No, you're good. Where is my... I thought I had it here. I think I need to go back out. How do I get it? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Um, And Arnell, I, I do have the slides, so if you do need me to pull them up, I'm happy to do so. I am just trying to figure out where it is. Oh, here it is. Sorry. Oh, goodness. There we go. Do you see that yet? I'm going to stop my share. Um, we do not see your screen yet. Okay. There it is. Needed a little practice there. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Here we go. We're good. There is perfect. Yep. Good afternoon, this is Arnell Abold. I'm with the Tonka Fund and um, today we are beginning with uh, Bison Basics 101. Um, we'd like to be, uh, we'd like to thank FACT for collaborating with us in honor of Native American Heritage Month and National Bison Day, which is Saturday, November 6, 2022. Uh, the presenters today will be Dr. Trudy Ekafi, the Executive Director of Tonka Fund, Jennifer Melitaire, our Technical Services Provider and Director, and Arnell Abled, myself as the Business Development Director for Tonka Resilient Agriculture Company. Who we are as Tonka Fund. Our mission is re restoring Buffalo to, to native lands, lives, and economies. The Tonka family, which is the TF there in the round circle, 
represents is representative of what we call the Tonka braid. And basically that is three separate companies intertwined together to create the Tonka family. And um, it started out with Native American natural foods, which some of you may know um, the Tonka bar, which is a meat and fruit protein bar that was created here in Kyle, South Dakota and is distributed nationwide. And from that came uh, Tonka Fund, which was established, I believe, in 2014 as a 501c3 nonprofit. And this came about in order to work with tribal producers, native producers, in developing their herds and programs. And eventually, um, we added the third part of the braid called the Tonka Resilient Agriculture Fund, LLC, which also known as TRAC, which is a for-profit company of the of this organi overall organization. And that is basically to help tribal producers create a value-added product and marketing strategies to assist them um, with their operations. The story of Tonka Fund basically came back is as I had indicated earlier, is a branch off of Native American Natural Foods, also known as NANIF. And they were the first to create the meat and protein bar known as the Tonka Bar. Tonka Fund was established in 2014 as a 501c3 nonprofit and has worked diligently with tribal producers in helping them grow and maintain their herds, start new herds, and develop infrastructure and ideally create some enthusiasm for the youth to connect with agriculture as well. Tonka Fund's mission is to return Buffalo back to Indian country to empower Native American producers to restore and sustain an economy that centers around the Buffalo. In 2018, um, out of that grew Tonka Resilient Agriculture Company, LLC, and that was in response to a need for looking at creating value-added products with tribal producers in organic, grass-fed, climate-smart practices, um, just kind of in line with helping um, create a different level of income for some of our tribal producers that are interested in that track. In our world, as uh, we do call the bison a buffalo. And so just this is just a little cartoon because there's a lot of controversy back and forth, bison and buffalo and what um, a lot of connotation is the water buffalo. But for Native American indigenous people, we do call the bison a buffalo. But this is just kind of the cute cartoon that kind of came along with that. The history of the buffalo, as everyone knows, is not a very beautiful picture and has been uh, qu quite horrendous over the, when you look back in time and just, you know, just short notes in the 1500s, there was an estimated 30 to 60 million bison roaming North America. In 1870, an estimated 2 million bison are slaughtered on the Southern Plains. And in 1872 to 1874, an average of 5,000 bison are killed per day, which equals 5.4 million bison are killed within a three-year period, eliminating the way of life for not only the buffalo, but for the indigenous people of the lands in the Great Plains. In 1884, less than 1,000 bison are remaining in the North American continent. It was in 1910 that conservation efforts began. And then present day, we are looking at well over 500,000 bison on the landscape in North America. And this is through efforts, not through, also, like not only through private ranching and nonprofits, uh, looking at uh, national parks, all of that all combined together, creating um, the return of Buffalo back to, to the landscape.
One of the things that has helped Tonka Fund kind of move forward with their mission was a vision that was created with their board and the people that initially started Tonka Fund. You know, and one of the one of those things would be, you know, imagine the return of thousands of native plants and animal species. The return of robust of a robust lo local food system. The return of a physical wellness to native communities and a shift from poverty to prosperity through a meaningful livelihood caring for the land and the buffalo. These are for the principles that guide that vision and the mission of Tonka Fund. We'll begin uh, buffalo and bison as we'll use it interchangeably, but most of it will be referred to as Buffalo 101. Some it, basic facts about buffalo is a buffalo, um, can live 12 to 20 years in the wild. Adult males are bulls. Females are known as cows and young, cow, um, young bison are called calves. An adult bull can weigh 2,000 to 2,200 pounds and a cow can weigh up to 1,000 pounds. A typical adult bison is six to six and a half feet tall and 10 to 12 and a half feet in length. Bison can run at speeds of 40 miles per hour. They can also jump as high as six feet. Very agile. Um, on the North American continent, there are two um, types of buffalo or bison. There's the wood bison, which is um, more familiar territories in Canada, way Northern North America and the Plains bison, which is where we're located. So the differences between those two is with a wood bison, the bulls average 1800 pounds and the plains bison averages six, up to 1600 pounds. Uh, woods bison are taller and their hump is more square, whereas a plains bison is stockier with a rounded hump. The plains, uh, the wood bison is darker in color versus the plains bison, which is lighter in color. A woods bison would, its cape usually does not form distinct boundary, a distinct boundary behind its shoulder. Whereas in the summer, a cape forms distinct boundary behind the shoulder on a plains bison. On a wood bison, you're gonna see long straight sloping hair down on the forehead, whereas on the plains bison, it's short and frizzy on the head. Wood bison have little or no shave hair on the forelegs, whereas the chank's hair um, is long and on the forelegs of a plains bison. And a woods bison's beard is small and pointed, whereas the plains bison's beard is large and round. Those are just some of the characteristics of the different types of bisons in North America. Sorry. Oops, oops. Sorry about that. Went back to us. So I'm going to have um, Trudy, Dr. Trudy Ekafi, will play a video of one of our producers just to give you an idea of what uh, Tonka Fun is like and some of the people that we work with. And then she has some of her presentation. Hi everyone, I'm gonna play this hopefully. This is some of our producers um, that we work with, Alex and Wayne on, on the Rosebud Reservation, just talking about um, you know, why they're in the Buffalo business. We have had hoped to get a producer here to visit with you all today. It, unfortunately, it's, a, well, it's a very busy time as people are doing roundups right now and transferring Buffalo and that kind of thing. So I'll play this. Well, cattle takes, like different pastures, it takes hay, it takes trucking and everything else, the capital that a young person from the reservation will probably never see in their lives. But for Buffalo, you know, there's ways to build an infrastructure that will last their lifetime. 
and where they can really see something growing. And hopefully that will contribute to the community. And then we're hoping that's the effect that we have here, start bringing Buffalo back here. And I thought that was going to be BAM, and unfortunately I got the wrong one up first, but we'll hopefully hear from BAM later on. And thank you, Arnell. Um, I will, uh, I'm Dr. Trudy Ekafi, and I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about bison behavior. I was going to show a really dramatic video of a buffalo um, attacking a, a tourist in Yellowstone, but I didn't want everybody to think, oh, that's the way buffalo always behave. <laughs> but they are a flight or fight type of animal. So most of the time, you know, you can chase them away, um, you know, herd them around just, just like cattle or goats or anything else. But um, they are very large. And if they feel like they are threatened or cornered, particularly if they feel like they're cornered or if they feel like you're uh, bothering their, their offspring or something, they will fight. And uh, maybe you've all heard of some of the, the things that have happened in some of the national parks. In fact, a biologist once told me that um, more people are injured or hurt by buffalo in a national park where they're at than any other animal combined, rattlesnakes or bears or anything, just because they seem like there's something you can go up and pet, but uh, they really are still a wild type of animal. Um, so, you know, it's just something to consider when you, if you were considering getting into this um, buffalo caretaking or becoming a producer, that there are probably, um, you know, a lot more, more energetic and a lot uh, wilder than any cattle or animal that you've probably been around. So usually when you are with being around them, being, it's best to be, you know, quiet, move slowly, um, and particularly if they're in smaller spaces. Um, there is a herd hierarchy. Um, usually it's it's a very, um, uh, any kind of herding type of, whether it's a lead cow or a lead animal, there's a hierarchy of, you know, the, the bigger animals, you know, usually over the younger animals or smaller animals. And so it's very much like, you know, I would say um, horse herds, you know, or like this, but they're very, very um, family orientated. You will see um, if you have a larger herds, you know, the mother will have her offspring close to her, her daughters particularly, and their offspring, you know, they'll stay kind of in these family herds. Typically, the males will eventually, after about a year or so old, they'll kind of get kicked off to the side, kind of have to fend for themselves. Um, so that's just some things to think about. Um, but normally, you know, they're kind of bunched up and herded together, um, except like if you are in large enough spaces, you'll see the bulls, particularly outside of the breeding season, they will be um, away from the females and, and particularly during calving season. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that more when we talk about breeding, but that's just some things to think about that they're very, um, family orientated. I always tell people, you'll know when a buffalo is stressed or feels, you know, like it's going to behave in, uh, maybe a, a, a little wilder behavior. It starts licking on itself and it tight tends to, you know, feel like it's agitated. Um, it starts frequently blinking and then when the lifting of the tail happens, you better be in a space where you're not close to them. Um, I typically tell, I would never trust a buffalo just that, you know, I, I give plenty of space in between them, um, you know, have it or have a very large uh, fence between you. Um, they do, or they will try to group in, together and huddle too when they're stressed out. So this is just some of the behavioral things we wanted to pick out that may be a little bit different than cattle. Um, or something, other livestock that you might be used to. Next slide, Arnell. So breeding is a little bit different too and more on a wild type of um, basis. Um, most of the time, the uh, bison or buffalo will only breed during the rut. That's their breeding season, which is usually runs from mid-July to mid-August. Um, and I'm not saying that they will not breed outside of those times. They will. Sometimes there's a what they would call a late rut. If a uh, female uh, does not conceive during the rut, then she may come back into estrus 
a little bit later in the summer or early fall and then there and then she might conceive then and so therefore you might have some lit calves that come a little bit later but typically that's you know about 90 percent of the animals kind of stick to that um, that breeding time and typically with that you don't have to worry necessarily about removing the bulls out of the the herd uh, like you might with cattle or or other because they their their energy levels testosterone levels and stuff are up during you know the rut season and typically we'll just leave the cows alone the rest of the the year um guest station there is approximately about the same as cattle as well 285 days so most calves will be born mid-april to mid-may uh, interestingly enough they kind of follow as the grass starts greening up um, that's when the calves are born um, most bison cows will not breed until they're two years of age uh, unlike other animals or livestock that you might be familiar with um, and then calve at three years of age bulls can breed usually at two years of age but because of kind of the hierarchy of the thing um, larger males usually get most of the breeding um, done and won't allow the younger bulls to come in to breed um, typically you can run one bull um, per you know 10 to 15 cows um, just like you would with cattle um, you don't have to have a lot of bulls in there um, but it, that's just kind of the general rule if you have a larger herd okay Arnell next slide A little bit about feeding and grazing. Um, again, they're, they're similar to cattle in this as well. Bison eat about 1.6% of their body mass per day of dry vegetation. Um, usually it equals about 24 pounds a day for an average, you know, full grown bison. Of course, you know, bulls, you know, as Arnell mentioned earlier, can get quite large, um, but uh, typically um, in that 24 pounds a day average. What do they eat? Well, they are obviously herbivores and they eat grass and the primary of their diet um, is grass and should probably be grass. Um, they will eat, you know, forbs and browse that are in, um, in, in, in season basically. So if you've got a forb coming up, you will see maybe eating some flower leaves off of a forb or when the tree, the trees, um, you know, or bushes or something that might be in the pasture, they may take a little bit of the browse or the leaves off, but primarily it's grasses and uh, that's typically what they eat. Um, you can, of course, grain feed um, bison if you prefer, um, you know, if you're trying to gain maybe a little more weight on them. Um, but they are pretty sensitive to what I call the hotter feeds, like the, you know, corn and oats and things like that, um, more so than cattle. Typically, you would want to not um, grain them as much, uh, you know, to put on that weight, mainly because their rumens, their stomachs, their four chambered stomach is uh, very sensitive to those hotter feeds. Um, even those animals that go into possibly a feedlot situation to gain weight a little quicker, um, they typically don't have a little, uh, mostly grass grain or, or, excuse me, mostly have forage and have a uh, choice, uh, bison can have a self-choice of how much grain they want to eat. Just because if you try to push it on them too much, again, bloating is a problem, you'll have some digestive issues and that kind of thing. So yeah, you can feed them all kinds of different kinds of grain, but you just got to be cautious. And, and energy, if you do, you introduce that grain slowly over time and don't give them a lot at the beginning, again, because of bloating. Um, you can also domesticated grasses and haze can be just good for them. I have legume type of hay such as alfalfa. Um, bison tend to be a little more sensitive, again, in their rumen to some of the, the domesticated um, haze such as alfalfa. But again, slowly introducing those um, grain or those those type of feeds to them has to be done slowly just so you don't disrupt the rumen. So that is a little bit different than cattle or maybe other livestock that you might be used to as well. They're just a little bit more sensitive to those kind of things and the rumen is a little more sensitive. Next slide. 
You know, there was a lot of questions and that uh, Larissa gave us ahead of time about, you know, how would this work in a more smaller environment? Um, and bison and tend to thrive a little bit better in larger environments where they have a little more room to graze and to move. But it doesn't mean that they can't be in situations where um, they can be maintained in smaller pasture, pastures. One of the projects we work with down in Texas is actually about 60 acres and 10 animals at this time. That's one of the smaller type of projects. And, you know, it's obviously depends on what part of the the you know nor, or america us that you're in you know and types of how much pasture it takes but um you know the rotational grazing and stuff like that can be done um with buffalo in fact they tend to <laughs> it's interesting enough um when people talk about you know rotating buffalo within a paddock or smaller paddocks you know every couple of days or every couple of weeks the bison tend to tell you when they're ready to move on to the next paddock. I had one producer talk about like, yeah, they, they tell me when to open the gate to the next paddock to graze or to do some rotational grazing. And uh, because they just know they're like, okay, it's time to go. And they can really be trained pretty easy. Um, if uh, you know, if you, you're trying to do some kind of paddock or rotational grazing, I think the the biggest thing on rotational grazing is, you know, the cost of fencing. I think that was another question we had that Larissa had uh, given us ahead of time. You know, yeah, rotational grazing is great, but uh, as Jennifer is going to talk a little bit later about handling and fencing and that kind of stuff, um, the cost, of course, goes up because of the type of fencing that you have. But I won't talk too much about that right now. Uh, Jennifer will catch up with us on that. So next slide. Uh, there's been a lot of, I'm not going to touch on this uh, in great depth, but um, I think there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, things with climate change and that um, Buffalo, because they evolved with uh, uh with kind of the landscape in North America versus maybe other livestock, they seem to utilize um, the, the, the forages better. Um, they maybe increase the diversity. There are some studies about increasing the diversity um, when bison are reintroduced. Um, I think a lot of that still depends on how you manage your animals. And of course, there's a lot of question about are bison, you know, reintroducing bison better for the car, you know, carbon sequestration in soil. I think those are just some things that are on the horizon. Um, they they tend to be a lot hardier than um, many of the domesticated animals, um, just because they're a very large animal and they kind of adapted with some of the harsh conditions in the environment. Um, that kind of thing. So that's just something we wanted to throw in there because there's been a lot of questions around about that. And I just wanted to, sh to share some of that. Next slide. Um, there, thank you. Um, there was a quite a questions, quite a few questions ahead of time too about um, health and vaccinations um, and even veterinarian work. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things like when it comes to veterinarian work, um, it depends on what situation. If you have an injured or sick buffalo, um, it kind of depends on how severe it is because of the stress it takes to handle them or to bring them into a confined place where you can treat them. A lot of producers um, purchase uh, some type of dart guns where they can administer antibiotics and that kind of thing if needed. Uh, from a distance instead of trying to move one as because they're such herding animals, herd animals, um, separating one buffalo from the herd, it tends to stress them out even more. Um, and routinely, and I said, like a lot of our producers right now are um, rounding up animals tend, tend to try to only do that once a year um, when they may administer some types of vaccinations. Um, there's a lot of debate about, do you need to vaccinate a buffalo, um, or what do you need to do? And typically I say that's kind of up to you. Uh, most of the vaccinations that have been developed, um, are, ca are cattle vaccinations. There are very few things that you can buy on the market that have specifically, 
um, you know, manufactured for buffalo and for the health of a buffalo. Uh, it includes minerals and salts and that kind of thing. So typically, a lot of people will just use the same things that they use on cattle. And um, again, some so no specific vaccinations are required for buffalo unless you, you always, you know, talk to your state vet or your local veterinarian um, to make sure that, you know, see if there is something that is required within the state. Um, many people will vaccinate their buffalo just to make their neighbors who raise cattle more comfortable because they don't want to be, you know, if, if one of their neighbor's animals comes um, down with something, you know, they don't want to say, hey, it's because the buffalo, my neighbor's buffalo aren't vaccinated. So, they, you know, they're mindful of that. Um, a lot of people, too, think that um, buffalo, all buffalo have something called brucellosis. Um, this is not the case. Back in the 70s, 80s, it was in a lot of, you know, different animals, cattle and, and others, uh, and in buffalo, and pretty much in most all the states, it's been eradicated for quite some time. But there are still cases of, of brucellosis in the greater Yellowstone buffalo herd in uh, the National Park. And um, basically what brucellosis cause is, is, you know, aborting, you know, the offspring. Um, of course, you wouldn't want that to happen to any other livestock as well. But, you know, when people say, oh, I don't want buffalo around because, you know, they all have brucellosis, this is not the case. It's pretty much been eradicated in, in all states except Montana and Wyoming, where the Yellowstone herd is, and it's just within that herd. But some states will still require a Bangs vaccination or a brucellosis vaccination when the, the cow is young. But again, always check with your local or state veterinarian about any requirements. Uh, next slide. I'm not going to go into depth on all these diseases, but these are some things that, um, you know, are a little out of uh, some things to think about when raising buffalo. Unfortunately, Microplasma bovis, which is a cattle disease, has reared its ugly head in some of the buffalo herds um, here and there. And microplasma bovis can be treated by antibiotics, but um, it doesn't, and it works well with cattle, but not for buffalo. Again, it's an antibiotic that's been developed for cattle and uh, the buffalo seem to be a little more susceptible to it. But there's a lot of study behind that. Um, and that can cause pneumonia-like symptoms and lethargic and swollen joints and that kind of thing. So it's something that, you know, is on the horizon of buffalo producers just because they want to be uh, cautious of it. And we don't know a lot about it and how it affects buffalo. I've already talked a little bit about brucellosis. Um, tuberculosis is another disease um, that some states require vaccinations on um, just because it may be something that's within the state. Um, and that, you know, may, may need to think about anthrax um, actually is not really a disease. It's more of when the, the anthrax spores come out of the ground, maybe used typically during like um, weather related, you know, large moisture related types. Um, and of course, if anybody's familiar with anthrax, it can kill the animals very quickly and if not treated by antibiotics and uh, people, you know, people handling the animals don't know that they have it, then typically the humans can get it as well. And that can be very dangerous and again, needs to be treated. One kind of thing that's a little bit out of the ordinary is uh, malignant catharo fever. Um, for some reason, you know, sheep get that um, periodically and, and, and can usually be treated or, you know, doesn't cause a lot of issues as far as I know. But if a buffalo becomes in contact with it, um, it can blind them and eventually kill them. Um, so I always kind of caution people like, you know, do you have any sheep herds near you or, you know, proximity? Just be aware that, you know, the sheep carry this, the buffalo can contract it. Um, I've heard about it maybe several times in the 20 years that I've been working with buffalo, but just something to think about if you have sheep near um, 
Of course, buffalo can get types of pneumonia, dust pneumonia, and things like that. Again, treated by antibiotics, but those, you know, and can typically, um, I always say that, you know, either a buffalo is healthy or a buffalo is dead. It tends like before you even know it's sick, um, it's gone. <laughs> uh, kind of like that, I think, with sheep. I used to have sheep when I was younger, and it's like you just don't know that they're sick until they're, you know, almost gone. And so buffalo tend to be that way. They don't show a lot of signs before um, when they're, you know, when they're, they could be very sick. So it's just something to think about, you know, um, about the animals. Next slide. Just a couple other things. I know there was some questions. Um, buffalo 10, you know, I always think to supplement buffalo with some type of mineral supplement, just like you would any other animal. You might consider if you're in a copper deficient area um, that you might increase your copper intake for them. Um, parasite control, internal and external. Typically anything that you might use for cattle, you could use for buffalo. Um, but I caution ex any kind of external parasite control. Um, Buffalo, uh, their skin is, is higher density than cattle. And if you're doing any kind of pour on or anything like that, they can be very acceptable to uh, burns and things like that because of their skin texture. Um, I always like to recommend diatomaceous earth. Um, you know, it's crushed uh, seashells where uh, buffalo, either internal or external, will roll in or wallow in. Um, or even to eat a little bit in some of their feed just to control parasites. Um, pink eye is another thing to kind of think about as well. For some reason, they're very susceptible to that, um, more so than maybe some other animals, but again, can be treated um, with antibiotics if you have to. Next slide. I'm just gonna touch on genetics. Um, Arnell talked about the two different type of breeds. Um, and she also touched on the history of, you know, that there was a lot of buffalo at one time. And then before, after the great slaughter, there was very few. Um, there was some breeding of cattle genes um, or mixing of cattle and buffalo. They will breed. Um, typically, sometimes the offspring are uh, infertile, uh, kind of like a mule crossing the donkey and a horse. But, um, but there are still animals that do have cattle genes. Um, some people tend to want, you know, pure bison, but I don't know, I don't see all that much difference if there's a few cattle genes in there. Um, one thing, you know, with any animals that you might be raising, think about, you know, switching um, bulls in and out just to keep the genetic diversity up and don't have any kind of inbreeding. So those are just some things on genetics, you know, to be mindful of. Um, it seems like a lot of buffalo producers will talk about like, where did your animals come from? Um, because there is a pathway. <laughs> There's a small, narrow window of where they came from. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of them from national park services and things like that. So um, just wanted to touch on that a bit. Next slide. Okay, I played the Alex and Wayne Fredericks video. Let me see if I can play another video for you before I pass it off to Jennifer. And she'll talk about handling and some other things. Let's see if I can get the right one here. All right. And since I'm supposed to play BAMS, I'll play BAMS now, hopefully. One time I had a guy that came out and hung around me one day, he hung around me one day, and that day that he came, we harvested a buffalo. Actually, Trudy, we yeah. are only yeah. able to hear right now. We don't see the actual video. Okay, let me try that again. <laughs> we don't let nothing go to waste, we save everything. But when we got done with that day, it was it was evening time and we were- Let's see why it's not showing. The, the, all the guys- well, I can't school. see it. Backwards. And that guy let off last. And I remember him when he got out of the truck, he said, thank you, ma'am. Is that up now? It is, yep. Okay, Perfect. let me kind of replay it just a little, real quick. Sorry about that. I don't know why. No I worries. Just... Got it. He came out and hung around me one day. He hung around me one day. And that day that he... Go to ways to save everything. 
But when we got done with that day, it was it was evening time, and we were, everybody was tired. And I I took the, the all the guys workers home, the helpers. And that guy I let off last, and I remember him when he got out of the truck. He said, "Thank you, ma'am. That was a, a cotton day." So thank you. That's my part of the presentation. I'll pass it off to Jennifer. Did we, is Arnell gonna start? What do we have to share with Arnell? I don't. <laughs> Are we cutting out? I hear you. I hear you, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, Arnell, did you wanna, I don't know if you're gonna go back to sharing the presentation. No, oh, Trudy, we don't hear you. Oh, you're on mute, Trudy. Okay. <laughs> Arnell? <laughs> Arnell has the video. <laughs> I'm not sure, hopefully we didn't lose her. Yeah, so I was thinking, like, where did Arnell go? She's on mute. Arnell. Oh, wait a minute. She sent me a message. Let me see. Hopefully she's not. Nope. Okay, there she is. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. I'm going to sign off here. Okay, are we ready now? Ready to roll? It oh. looks good, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Trudy and Ms. Arnell, for everything from the presentation here to you previously. Um, greetings, everyone. My name is Jennifer Malater, and I'm the technical service provider for Tonka Fund. Um, I've been with Tonka Fund, just a little background over, well, it was a year in October, and I'm loving every minute of it. <laughs> but anyway, to go on with our presentation, I'm going to talk about fencing. Or pastures. Well, okay, pastures. I know there was a question that was asked of what the stocking rate is for the buffalo. And you could have a stocking rate can be from two to three cow calf pairs per acre. So pretty much is the same as what is in cattle um, as far as stocking, and they will do just fine on that that ratio. On a uh, someone else asked the question about uh, how what their average daily gain was, and a young buffalo can gain anywhere from two point five pounds to four pounds a day, and that is in on pasture also. And you're obviously going to get more towards the four pounds if you give a little bit of supplement feed. And Shirley had talked about the pros, pros and cons of that. Next slide, please. Next, we're gonna talk about is handling a buffalo. Um, buffalo are a little bit harder to contain than what cattle are. Um, do not trust a buffalo. We talked about that. Definitely keep your distance. And buffalo only go where they want to go. <laughs> so it's pretty tough to put them in. But if you go slow and steady and move them very slowly and quietly, things, they, they go and they go actually really pretty darn good. Next slide. Um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is fencing and corrals. On the left side, you can see um, the picture of the, of the Buffalo fence. That's down at the pictures in Texas Buffalo Project in Texas. This was one of our first sur surplus buffalo that we got and it was sent down there to them. But you can see they're fencing how high it is by just looking at the um, steel post. And they got six wires, five wires on this fence. And I, I believe on the other fence that faces the road, she does have six wires. And if you look on the far right, this was taken at that Niagara Valley Preserve. And this was just taken last week. And that's the surplus buffalo that we received from, um, from them. And they're just kind of standing in their corrals, just waiting to see what's going to happen next. But you can tell by looking at the panels how much higher they are than what they are for cattle. We're probably looking at maybe eight to 10 feet high panels compared to what you would use for a cow, which is at probably around your six feet high. And this is because buffalo are such good jumpers. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a little picture of what the brown otter buffalo corrals look like. As you can see, they have a lot of alleyways going up into their corrals in different 
they're um, divided out into paddocks. And they're also during the, if you look at the alleyway, you can see that the fence is also higher in that area. So the buffalo don't try jumping over as NRL, RNL has stated that they can jump at least six feet high. So we wanna make sure we have good panels and corrals to keep them in because they can jump. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, unlike livestock, fencing is a bit more complex for buffalo. Fencing is just five to six strands of bob wire, as I showed in that previous picture down in the Texas Buffalo Project. Your posts are a lot taller, anywhere from six to eight feet. The cost per foot is for a foot of fencing is essentially one third higher than that for cattle. And that's just due to the fact that you gotta buy taller posts and more bobbed wire. Um, the cost can range from 10 to $15,000 per mile. So you're, it's very costly to get your fencing up for when you're ready to get your buffalo in. Um, an adequate handling, handling facility for buffalo can cost fifty to $75,000. And that just includes, you know, the panels and the alleyway and the chutes and the, oh, so many things that can be included in it, but that's what we, it needs to be a little bit stronger for our buffalo. Buffalo caretakers need security and support and guaranteed long-term access to land to justify the cost of invest investing in a buffalo program. And the reason why I put that there is they need longer, everyone, not only Native Americans, but everyone needs longer leases in order to justify being able to pay um, the $15,000 per mile for to put a fence in for buffalo. Next slide. Okay, next we're gonna talk about the pastures. Um, buffalo pastures are unique when it comes to grazing. The study conducted, a study conducted by the Applied Ecological Science, AES, found that returning buffalo to the landscape improved the soil quality compared to nearby non-regeneratively managed cattle graze pastures. Um, buffalo graze is what we're told is, buffalo graze in a different way than what cattle do. They graze leaving an inch or so above of the grass on there to allow for the root to grow stronger and therefore resulting in more hardier plants. Whereas a cow or cattle and other animals, horse and sheep included, graze right down to the ground. So it makes the, the plant is able to develop a nice strong hardy root system for regrowth. Okay, next slide. Um, Here's a little a slide, a little clip on what it looks for a rotational grazing. This is obviously just some paddocks of grazing. So you can just imagine it in pastures also. Um, it's This is called a slow grazing, rot rotational grazing. It's two pastures, which moves from every two weeks to every few months. Um, planned rotational grazing is strategic moves every three to 10 days to allow for rest and recovery in grazed pastures. Management intensive grazing, more structure system where moves are completed every one to four days. Well, if you look, I mean, if you take the scenario that's pictured on the right, and if you have a larger paddocks and a larger number of animals, you can actually put your livestock in, split them up and put them in say paddock three and six and move them every three to 10 days in a clockwise position. And that way it will give time for the grasses by the time six gets to where three is, the grasses will have been re already have re regrown and be ready for the buffalo with their nutrients. Next slide. Okay, now, what we're gonna talk about now is marketing. On live, online live auctions are trending in Buffalo country. Um, this just makes it a lot easier for the producers, it's safer for the animals. And another thing is right why we're going towards online live animal auctions is many sale barns don't allow for buffalo to come into the facility due to the massive size can be destructive to the equipment. And also it's for the safety of the producers that are buying at the sale barn since their fencing isn't as high as what you know buffalo can jump over. So we're just playing it all safe. <laughs> Obstacles in marketing buffalo products in Indian country. They're small or geographically remote located. 
tribes are. Many struggle on marketing their products due to no USDA meat processing facilities nearby. No state inspector available for inspection. Our costs may be too costly for smaller tribes. Um, I'm trying to think of what it was here in North Dakota for the state inspector to come out to inspect the buffalo herd that I managed here. Um, it was like 70 some dollars an hour. And that was a few years back. So I'm assuming it must be higher than that. Um, due to lack of tourism in these remote areas, there's no support revenue revenue support, tourism revenue generation. Uh, marketing resource to reach high end clientele who pay top dollars for the buffalo hunts. Um, buffalo hunts can cost anywhere from say a thousand, 500 up to $10,000, depending on what kind of animal you want. If you want that large, beautiful, great looking bull, you're gonna pay, you're gonna pay the money for it. And that's what another way we can market some of our animals. And another thing that I'd like to talk about, oh, no, we're good right here. How to market your Buffalo products. Online, grocery store, and office sales. When I talk about online sales, I'm talking about as a producer having online sales where the, um, the consumer can look at the product that they have for sale and order it online and just have it shipped to them. Um, grocery store, the producer has their label on a packaged product that is sold, their product is sold in the grocery store, but it's like another grocery store label, but it is also labeled by the producer. Office sales are when your consumers come to your producer's office and buy cuts that are readily available. This is not too common, um, but I think as time goes on, it's going to be it's going to be the way to buy your meat. Next slide. Okay. Um, grocery stores, you could, you could buy buffalo in just like you do in beef. In pork, oh, I kind of cut the one off on the right, but that is, you can also buy that buffalo uh, bundle in however you want them and how much you want to spend. Uh, meat markets, that would also be like when you would go into a meat market to order a half a beef. You can go into a meat market and order half a buffalo. Um, as far as the sea store, we're kind of talking about buffalo products would be like the Tonka Fun Bar, um, beef jerky, and different things like that. And when we're kind of talking, I kind of want to mention the markets for the buffalo on the East Coast. When I done some looking online, I was think, looking at the prices of what buffalo cost. When I looked at a chuck roast at three pounds in boneless, it was $58.85. Sirloin tips roast at six pounds was $101.65. And USD, USDA prime beef tenderloin roast were $360. Four dollars and ninety-five cents. So, as you can see, the prices are quite high as you get to the East Coast, and that's a supply and demand kind of thing. But hopefully, someday we can get some more buffalo out on the East Coast and get some of these prices to where we can start eating more healthier buffalo. Next slide, please. Um, when you're marketing your buffalo, there are many other things that you can market. And that would be the meat. Obviously, we can talk about that. Uh, the bones. And the bones are used in many different things. Like, obviously, the skulls are used them for decorations. There are also um, many Native Americans who use buffalo bones and different things, horns in their regalia. Um, hides. The hides are just beautiful. Whether they're pro in, get them on process or processed, you could sell them either way. The tallow is the fat from the buffalo. And that's basically just to um, flavor your foods. The hunts. Hunts are offered sometimes on a lottery system, or you can buy a hunt um, on different uh, um, producers from different producers, or you can just sell live animals. Doesn't necessarily have to be a not, uh, meat. Next slide. And another way market your animals to see what I talked about earlier with the auction barns and how it probably wasn't a good idea and how the auction barns didn't like buffalo coming into their facility because they are large they're very large animals compared to cattle and they're strong and they're 
they can be aggressive if pushed too hard or pushed someplace where they don't want to go. And as are now presents, presented earlier that these buffalo can jump up to six feet. So that little panel you're seeing in the front of the auction ring, a buffalo can jump over that. So imagine yourself sitting at the auction trying to buy a buffalo that jumps over. <laughs> Um, online auctions. I talked about this a little bit earlier, how I, online auctions are the way to go. Um, it's not only used in the, the buffalo industry, it's used in the cattle industry, horses. I've seen goat and sheep auctions. Um, this is just one that I'm familiar with, and that's DVA auction. And what they do is they come out to your farm or to your ranch and take pictures of your animals in their natural settings. So you can get, you know, some really nice pictures of them. And it's also safer for the animals and safer for the people that handle are handling the animals at the auction time. Um, and they just come to your farm and they set up their cameras and you just do an online auction and you get, it's the same thing as going to a live auction. You get your catalogs, your bidding numbers, you get a bank approval number. So yes, definitely the new trend. Next slide, please. Um, here's an auction that, let's see, it will be coming up oh, pretty soon, November 5th, and that's at Custer State Park. Um, you can go online and go ahead and look at what they have to offer and how they they talk about how you can, if you look on the online catalog, they tell you what you have to do to register to be a bidder. And you can get your animals that way. And that's they'll be showing just pictures, again, also our videos, pictures and videos of the animals that are available for sale. Next slide. Transportation. Um, transportation, I know that will, I can't remember if that was a question, but transportation, buffalo can be transported in the same way cattle and other livestock can. They can travel by semi, stock trailer, airplanes, boats, etc. cetera. Um, you do have to get health papers in order to transport any animals across the state on state highways or across state to another state. And it, like I said, then there's a permit that's required between these sales. And if you look on to the right, there's Dr. Trudy and Miss Arnell. This was just at our roundup in at the end of October at Nibrera Preserve. And we are loading, well, we aren't loading. <laughs> We're standing on the side while they're loading the buffalo into the into the semi-trailer. And the last slide that I have is how, about stock trailers, how you can move buffalo in stock trailers. These buffalo right here came from the Great Sand Dunes of National Park and Preserve. And they actually went, traveled in this trailer. I can't remember, how, I wanna say it was, it was a long distance, like maybe 16 hours. I'm not even quite sure, I can't remember. In this horse trailer, and they went to the Texas Tribal Buffalo Project. So as you can see, we had, um, the smaller animals were in the front, there was three of them. And then the two larger cows, we did separate them just so the, that if the, the bigger cows were wanted to fight the younger ones, we didn't have to worry about that because they were separated by a door. But that's how they made it to Texas. Yes. And that's it for me. Let me unmute. Let me play this video real quick of it. And then I think it's time for Q&A and I'll pass it back to Clarissa just real quick. Hopefully I can get it to come up right away. This is again, one of our other producers here in Pine Ridge. Oops. Give me a second. I'm not sure why it's not playing. Maybe it doesn't want to play. Oh, that's a good one, too. Well, I think, oh, shoot. Well, anyway, that's one of our producers. It's not playing for me. So I guess we'll I'll stop sharing and I'll turn it back to Larissa. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, um, Arnell, Trudy, and Jennifer. That was really wonderful. Such great information. Um, and yeah, we can, if there are if there's a link for that video, we can also share it later with folks. Um, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. I don't know. I I don't know about Zoom sometimes. Um, 
So we do have a bunch of questions that came in. We'll try to get to them. I, I, I recognize that we are kind of already over time, um, but maybe we can spend the next 10 minutes and see what we can get through. If that sounds okay with you ladies, I wanna be respectful because um, I know it's getting late in the afternoon for depending on time zones and everyone's busy. Um, but I'm just going to, so Sam, do you wanna, do you wanna start? Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen. Sure, we actually had a couple of people ask questions about um, the other animals that uh, you would recommend bison grazing with. Yeah, I can take that. Um, you know, other than, I have heard of people, you know, um, having cattle and buffalo grazing together or in the same paddocks. Um, anything smaller, you know, um, typical well and i've heard of people um grazing horses and and with buffalo but they typically don't like too many other things in there with them <laughs> so that's yeah i've heard of people doing it and in, in, in a large enough space um and if they're used to each other they seem to tend to get along but i haven't heard of anything smaller than say maybe cattle um you know, grazing with them. Um, you guess it probably depends on the space that they have as well. You know, if they don't have a large space where they, you know, that animal, because they are very protective and uh, yeah, they kind of like to, to be the top of the, top of the, the hierarchy for sure. <laughs> awesome. Thank and you. we've also seen some you know, wild animals, of course, like deer and elk and pronghorn. I think they're called pronghorn. I'm not even sure what those little things are called, but um, I've seen them in buffalo pastures also. Interesting. So a couple, a couple. This came up a couple of times that so folks are wondering if you can train buffalo to respect an electric fence, and mm -hmm. if they are spooked, and for some reason, will that fence hold up? Will it make a difference? Is it worth it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard of quite a few people using like the high tensile electric fence, you know, one or two, maybe three wires of high electric, you know, and maybe having the fiberglass poles that, you you know, you can take in and they do, they will respect it. Um, you kind of have to like any animal have to kind of train them that this is a hot wire. Um, so I've heard of people moving their animals around with that just has to probably be a little bit more intense, um, you know more wire you know probably two or three wires versus just one and and usually has to kind of be at one wire has to be kind of at nose level so um yeah i have heard of people you know rotating animals with that or moving you know through pastures with um electric high tensile electric so actually i have a question for you trudy <laughs> so sorry i'm jumping ahead of all these other questions and but it's in it's in, it's related to what you just said so um do you do you find that they do better if you train them when they're younger so like with pigs you want to train pigs when they're super young but cows seem to sort of catch on pretty quickly because they're you know their noses are so sensitive and um they're not quite you know they're not they're not quite as they back up when they get hurt rather than a pig that just like pushes forward would is it was a buffalo going to be more like a cow that's going to pull back or is it going to be more like a pig that pushes through uh, it's going to pull back they're very sensitive i think maybe because of their skin their density of their skin um structure they seem to be very sensitive even though they have a lot of wool you know certain mm -hmm. times of year. it seems like i've seen full-grown buffalo you know being turned out into high tensile or electric fence situation and they respect it right off and they remember to respect it even if the wire, wire isn't hot anymore <laughs> they tend to stay away from it they i think because of their sensitivity i think maybe so yeah they tend to get away from it so so when you say hot what are you saying how how many um what sort of uh, strength should you be looking at for your no energy? i don't know that i don't know if jennifer or Nell have had any experience with that um but um i don't i can't remember <laughs> i'm sorry okay. I have to that. no that's okay all right um so am i asking the next question larissa <laughs> i think so <laughs> after asking about it does it count <laughs> I asked my own. Um, we actually had somebody who's interested in getting on your surp. Uh, how do you get on the surplus bison list? And I'm just going to let them contact you um, to get that information. Um, and then um, uh, we had a lot of questions. And one one question from Jason. Um, he asked, "What's and this is a good question? I think what's the minimum recommended herd size?" Yeah, that is a good question. I. 
I guess it depends on what your situation is, you know, your breeding situation. Um, you know, I've seen herd sizes, you know, very small, you know, five, 10 animals. I, uh, if you talk to some of the large conservation programs that they, they, they don't think anything less than a thousand. So, um, to, to really mimic like, you know, the, the historical, you know, presence of them, you know, with the soil and the grasses and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I don't know if there's any real right. I don't know, or Jennifer, I know you can speak to that. I guess it really also depends on how many acres they have and how well they're going to manage their acreage in their grasslands. Yeah. Um, you want to go ahead? Is, yeah, well, just kind of building off of that. Someone's asking, do you have a handful of tips for for folks thinking of taking the plunge into buffalo slash bison, what would you tell them kind of like um, things to consider or, you know, the first couple steps to take? And someone actually, I should say, did refer them um, to the National Bison um, Association and the state associations, which is probably also really good advice. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, you know, I was gonna, I actually wrote it on the top of my question list here. Yeah, contact the NBA, the National Bison Association. They have a ton of resources on their website for beginning and, um, you know, I, but I always think to people like, you know, they, you, they get the animals, um, think about your marketing, you know, what, what's your plan? Just don't get the animals and say, oh, well, now I got to get rid of you. <laughs> you know, too many. Think about how you're going to market them if it's live sales or meat sales or something. That's what I would tell people, you know, to, and then um, think about too, like your infrastructure and that kind of thing. And another good thing to remember is that this isn't a part-time job to have livestock of any kind. It's 365 days a year. <laughs> and if you're not there, if you want to take a vacation, you need to find somebody to take care of your animals while you're not there. <laughs> I, and I, what I love about Buffalo though is, you know, people like, you know, during lambing season or, you know, uh, that kind of thing, you know, you have to be pretty close in case I, I know, I always laugh at one of my producers because as the cat, we have a lot of cattle here on Pine Ridge, you know, they're out there, you know, to assist possibly, you know, checking their cows, assisting. And I always ask my friend Ed, I'm like, oh, what are you doing this spring? He's like, and because you don't really, one thing about that, it's good about Buffalo is you don't really, there's nothing really you can do to assist them there with, you know, calving season um, because, you know, they just, fortunately, and they seem to have very little problems with calving. Um, so that's one thing that maybe you don't have to hang her so close with, right, Jennifer? <laughs> with yeah. some of their livestock. <laughs> A little less intense than some of the other animals you might have. I, I do want to add that I, you know, I could reiterate, you do want to plan if you are having, are you thinking about raising buffalo? And um, make sure you put your business plan together. Look at what, what you have available. Um, be real careful about it because when spring comes around and you you end up with calves and then you got then you're growing and it, and it happens very quickly. <laughs> so, yeah. So Jason actually had um, two other things I would really like to ask you guys. Um, one is about um, do you ever AI? Or is that something you don't worry I about? I never, yeah, I never have heard of that, but I've never heard of anybody having to do that no. or have considered doing it. Maybe, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming he's just thinking to bring in new genetics. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, sure I, there, I'm sure people have tried it, but I, I've not been around with <laughs> anybody that has, so yeah. yeah. I'm thinking the else. stress of having two AI at Buffalo would be a little bit... I think it'd be scary. I don't think I'd want yeah, to. Not too fast. <laughs> it would probably be high just due to the fact of the stress that you're putting on the animal. And the yeah. other question he had was about castration of your calves, of the calves. When do you castrate? Yeah. Oh, good question. We did not yes. add that because typically no one does castrate. Oh, um, really? Okay. No, no. And the reason is because they haven't seen any real results with castrated um, buffalo. You know, what do we tend to castrate everything else so that animal grows bigger and, you know, um, faster and, you know, has less, you know, maybe wildness about it or something. They have not seen that in buffalo. So typically, I don't know anybody that does. Um, I Very few people um, dehorn anymore. Um, there were some people, you know, would 
dehorn them sometimes, but no castrations that I've ever heard of anymore because they just don't see any of the benefits of it. Um, kind of the older, bigger bulls keep the younger bulls that you might be keeping for meat animals or something in check. And yeah, typically don't worry about it. Okay, maybe two, um, maybe two more. And one that this is actually is an interesting question to me is how good is a buffalo's memory? Do they remember people, locations, gates? Can they be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're, yep. they're very smart. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Arnell, are you going to say something? I didn't want to. No, I was going to say they the, they no, they'll learn a routine. They'll remember things that you wouldn't even think of. I mean, moving even when they're being moved from pasture to pasture, if they just know, it's almost like they know where the gate is. They know, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I think you're right. They're very aware of their surrounding. And I always say like the memory of an elephant. I always think of the memory of a buffalo. Because right. once they've been there and they kind of, yeah, remember, you know, they will remember trucks. You know, I was a biologist working with buffalo and they didn't seem to be afraid of my, or, you know, leave when my truck would come around. But if a ranger who might be going out there uh, to harvest one seen what they'd seen their truck, they were moving out. I mean, that was how specific it would get. You know, I don't know if um, they, just, yeah, they just knew my truck versus, you know, maybe a ranger truck. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. They remember. Yeah, and uh, Chris wrote in that they um, remember, they seem to remember travel routes. Uh, the, the herd will teach itself if one of them finds a weak gate or a spooky spot, the whole herd knows about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And apparently they train their bison to a cattle call and feed bucket. So, mm -hmm. yep. interesting. so interesting yep. yeah. behavior. They're very, yeah, I think like I said earlier, they're very easy, you know, to train with, you know, um, because they remember so well, I think is one. Yeah, definitely. Sam, you want to pick one more question? I don't know. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I've been reading through them. <laughs> it's really, really cool. Um, there's the one about the trichomoniosis. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah sorry. I knew to, I do know how to pronounce that, but I cannot today for some reason. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't carry it. Yes, they can. They can. In fact, one of the research projects I was involved with, we were testing um, for trichomosis, and we did find it in limited quantities. Um, so that's something that's concerned, but, and I think in Yellowstone too, when they were doing some harvesting of animals, we're testing for it, and it does, I don't know, maybe it doesn't affect them, um, maybe as much as it would if there were some cattle or other livestock, but yeah, they do carry it, and I didn't go into that. I, I thought about putting it on there, but I didn't, so yes, they can carry it. Thank you, Trudy. Yeah, thank you, Sari. I really appreciate um, taking the time um, to answer these questions and really put together this, this, this presentation about all that you're doing. And I know that Tonka Fund is going to be very, very busy in the next, well, what, next couple of five years, you all are working with, <laughs> <Five> um, <laughs> at least, <laughs> are working with um, South Dakota State and other partners. Yes. Right? Yeah. So you have some big projects, which is very exciting. And Hopefully we'll <laughs> keep hearing all the good work that you're doing. Um, but before we sign off, I did want to share, share just a few things uh, for folks that are still on the line. Um, the slides and recording will be available soon. I'm going to post them on our website for um, forever, for posterity's <laughs> purposes. Uh, <laughs> and um, I'm sure Tonkapon will have this as well and um, put it on theirs. And, um, and I will be sending an email out hopefully later today as, as as soon as things are processed and uploaded um, to everyone so they can have that for their records. Um, we do have a couple of, uh, um, we have lots of other good sessions coming up. Next week will be a really interesting one about, um, about how to <laughs> entice animals to eat unpalatable plants. And Dr. Fred Provenza is gonna be with us from, um, he's uh, out of Utah, Utah State University. He was with us a couple of years ago. So really, really good one. Um, I will be sure to send out links to all of our upcoming webinars and other services, including our uh, mentorship program that, as a reminder, we are accepting applications to through the end of the month. But I would like at this time just to thank you all, Trudy, Arnell, Jennifer. It's been really wonderful um, working with you to put this on, an honor and a pleasure to be with you and have you on to celebrate um, uh, bison and, and native and national native american month um 
I hope that we can continue to collaborate and figure out ways that we can work together and to help producers and animals and 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 you know and folks across the country. Um, a sh shout out to you, Samantha. Thanks again for your help in running this and helping behind the scenes. And then to everyone out in the audience, thank you for being here, your interest in this topic and your attention. I hope that, um, <laughs> thank you for all the, the hearts that I see. I know, it's <laughs> I know. floating. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That was nice. Yes, it's a great <laughs> webinar, guys. I was, I was really looking forward to it. So yes. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much for thank inviting you. us. Yeah, yes, I really appreciate thank you. it. Yay, yeah. and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Bye. 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 <laughs>